Welcome to my channel. I'm Scott and if you want to catch my newest video, I post one every day. In this video, I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Coca-Cola stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. The Coca-Cola Company is a beverage corporation with headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia. It manufactures, retails, and markets non-alcoholic beverages. The company produces Coca-Cola, invented in 1886 by a pharmacist. In 1889, the formula and brand were sold for $2,300 to Asa Griggs Candler, who incorporated the Coca-Cola company in 1892. The company has operated a franchise distribution system since 1889. The company largely produces syrup concentrate, which is then sold to various bottlers throughout the world who hold exclusive territories. The company owns its anchor bottler in North America, Coca-Cola Refreshments. The company's stock is part of the Dow Jones Industrial Average and the S&P 500. This company is the world's largest producer of plastic waste. Let's get started with the model. This is a large cap company, 219 billion market cap. They're trading at $51 a share and they have 4.3 billion shares outstanding. Let's look at the financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the future free cash flows and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So you can see the company has lots of free cash flow each year. Five and a half billion up to eight and a half billion. Net income is the profit and loss on the business. It's revenue minus expenses and they also have lots of net income 1.2 billion then jumps way up to six and a half billion then increases to almost nine billion then drops a little in the trailing 12 months to 8.3 billion revenue is a sales for the company and that's pretty steady it's 35 billion in 2017 and then goes to 33 and a half billion in the trailing 12 months this is the company's income statement the top line is the revenue the sales for the company Below that is the cost of revenue. These are the costs directly related to generating those sales. Then the difference is the gross profit, and that was $20 billion. It's fairly steady each year, the gross profit. It did peak in 2019 at $22.6 billion. Below gross profit is their operating expenses. And then the difference between gross profit and operating expenses is operating income, which is $9.7 billion. That's also fairly steady each year. It did peak once again in 2019 at 10.5 billion. The company does have a lot of debt, so they have a pretty high interest payment on their debt, 933 million. And then there's other income and expenses. This is when a company generates money outside of its core operations, and that was 1 billion in trailing 12 months. And then of course taxes. And then the bottom line of the income statement is the net income. And that's really high in a trailing 12 months in 2019. The reason net income was so low in 2017 was they had five and a half billion of taxes. That looks odd because they had 6.7 billion of pre-tax income, but five and a half billion of taxes. That's like a 90% tax rate. In 2017, the US government applied a one-time tax penalty to a lot of companies. The reason the government applied this tax penalty is because a lot of companies were keeping cash overseas to avoid paying taxes in the United States. And here's a breakdown since the year 2000 of their revenue, net income, stock price, and employees. You can see their revenue was growing pretty steadily from 2000 to 2012 up to 48 billion, but it's been decreasing since 2012. Net income peaked in 2010 at 11.8 billion. The only thing that's pretty much going up steadily is their share price. Although it was decreasing from 2000 to 2005, overall it appears to be increasing. It's at its peak in 2019. There's also a bell curve with the employees, peaking in the middle, then dropping again. This is the statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates from its operational business. Then you have capital expenditures, which are investments in property, plant, and equipment. Operating cash flow minus CapEx gives you your free cash flow. And this company has lots of free cash flow, $7.3 billion in a trailing 12 months. It was a little lower than 2019 at $8.4 billion. 
but still seven billion of free cash flow. That gives the company the ability to pay a dividend. They could pay down debt, grow their business, or buy back stock. And this company does all four of those things. Each year it appears that the company's rolling their debt. In 2017, they issued 30 billion, paid down 29 billion. In 2018, it was very similar as well. 2019, it also appeared that they're rolling their debt. In the trailing 12 months though, they have taken on some more debt. They issued 30 billion, paid down 21 billion. When I say rolling their debt, I mean issuing new debt to pay down the old debt. The most important part of any business is their operating cash flow. If a company can't generate positive and consistent operating cash flow, it doesn't have much of a business. And this company generated 8.9 billion in the trailing 12 months. To calculate operating cash flow, you, you take net income, which is 8.4 billion, and then you have to add or subtract to the non-cash items that were on the income statement. They passed through a $1.7 billion gain on the income statement, so we have to minus that out on the statement of cash flows. They also passed through a $1.5 billion depreciation expense. That brings down your net income, but that's a non-cash item. So we have to add that back on cash flow from operations. And then there's some other non-cash items. Then we have to adjust for changes in working capital. So even though their net income was 8.4 billion, they generated 8.9 billion of operating cash flow. Let's look at a capital structure, 21 billion of equity, 42 billion of debt, and they have 32 billion of net debt. So they have about 10 billion of cash on their balance sheet. They have one third equity, two thirds debt. So they're a bit leveraged. Their WAC is 6.11% and that's a discount rate we're gonna apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated terminal value, which is all cash flows past year for that's 225 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $203 billion. We divide that by 4.3 billion shares. We get a calculated stock price of $47. They're trading at $51, so they're trading at an 8% premium. It's a sell according to the model. Simply, Wall Street's valuation is pretty much where the stock is trading at. So it seems like the stock was going up for a few years and it peaked in March, then the crash, so it dropped a lot. It's increased about 60 or 70% since the bottom, but it's trading at a pretty nice discount relative to its all time high back in March. And I'd much rather overpay for a stock like Coca-Cola than underpay for a garbage company because I know in the long run Coca-Cola will always be there and the garbage company will probably go bankrupt one day so my stock will be worth nothing. So the company increases its dividend each year from 35 cents up to 41 cents. They pay a 3.2% dividend yield. To calculate dividend yield you can just add up the last four dividend payments, sum those up, then divide by the stock price. And their payout ratio is 85%, which is pretty high. That's annual dividend payment over net income. And they pay out 96% of their free cash flow. So they're giving most of their money back to their shareholders in the form of dividends. This company has a really low beta, 0.58, so the stock moves about half the market. The stock has gone down 10% in the last 52 weeks, much worse than the S&P 500. The low was 36, the high was 60. The stock is trading above its 200 day moving average, but below its 50 day moving average. And this is a very liquid stock. 16 to 23 million shares are traded each day for this stock. And of the 4.3 billion shares outstanding, 3.9 billion are on float. And about 68% of the shares are held by institutions. And it has a really low short percentage, only 59 basis points. If you invested $10,000 into this company 10 years ago and reinvested the dividends, you'd have $21,600 today. If you did not reinvest the dividends, you'd have $20,000 today. If you invested $10,000 in Coca-Cola back in January 2011, you could have sold the stock at any point and you would have made a profit. This is why people invest in companies like Coca-Cola is because over time they only go up and they've been around so long, you don't have to worry about them going out of business. Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway is the biggest shareholder at 9.3%, then Vanguard, BlackRock, State Street, and Wellington. Let's look at the financial ratios. The average PE for the market's 11.9, the median is 14.8. 
PE is stock price over earnings per share. To calculate earnings per share, that's net income over shares outstanding. They're at 26.3, so they're a bit worse than the median and average. 26.3 means investors are paying $26.30 for $1 of earnings. Price of sales is stock price over sales per share. They're at 6.6 .6 between the median and average. Price to book is stock price over book value per share. They're at 10.4, much worse than the median and average. And book value per share is equity over shares outstanding. Equity is assets minus liabilities in a balance sheet, and they have $21 billion of equity but negative 7.8 billion of tangible equity. So they have a lot of intangible assets on their balance sheet. The way a company gets intangible assets is through acquisitions. Interest coverage ratio is EBIT over interest expense, so they can easily cover their interest payment. ROE is net income over equity. They have a great ROE, 39%. Current ratio is current assets over current liabilities. They can only cover 80% of their current liabilities with their current assets. And their current assets are $11 billion of cash, $4 billion of receivables, and $3.3 billion of inventory. So it does appear the company will need more debt to get through the next 12 months. They did have positive $7.3 billion of free cash flow, but their working capital is negative $6.5 billion. Working capital is current assets minus current liabilities. Plus they have a $7 billion dividend payment. The best way to look at ratios is to compare them to similar companies. I've done videos on Coke. Dr. Pepper, Monster, and Pepsi, all in the same industry as Coca-Cola. And Coke is the bottling arm for Coca-Cola. It's a separate entity. So if KO has a number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have a number in green, they're better than the average. So they're worse in all the price multiples. They're also worse in current ratio, but this could be a timing thing. Possibly next quarter or the following quarter, their current ratio will be above one. They have a great ROE, they are higher in debt than the average company. They're the biggest company on this list and they pay a pretty nice dividend, 3.2%, much bigger than average. So I do have them trading at an 8% premium, but Coca-Cola can always be a buy. As long as you hold the stock long-term, you could always make money. If you buy and sell within a month or two, you never know on any stock, but in the long-term, you're gonna make money on this stock. They also pay a nice dividend and they're still bringing in healthy free cash flow. It is a little concerning that their revenue is going down, but still it's a massive revenue number. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.